Today, we're gonna to continue looking at the unit circle approach to trigonometric functions. So what we have here is a unit circle. That means it's a circle with a radius of one. That's what the unit refers to. So this is a unit circle. This is a way of looking at trig functions of angles that are more than 90 degrees that don't fit into nice right triangles. So the way it works is that we've got this unit circle. And so we've got coordinates going all the way around the circle. So this point is at one zero. At the top here, I've got the point zero one. Over here, um, I've got the point negative one zero. And down here, the point zero negative one. And then back to one zero. So the unit circle is a radius of one. That's what we're referring to with the unit circle. For convenience, we're putting the center at the origin. And so once we got the unit circle, our sine and cosine of an angle can just be the y and x coordinates going around the unit circle. So if I have an angle theta, theta will intersect the unit circle, the terminal side of theta will intersect the unit circle the x coordinate will be the cosine of theta, and the y coordinate will be the sine of theta. Since uh, what we're going to do is pull the right triangle out of this, uh, the unit circle, because that's where we started our trigonometry journey. We started with ratios of opposite, adjacent, and hypotenuse. So what we're going to do is take this theta and I'm gonna, from the point cosine theta, sine theta, I'm gonna drop a line down perpendicular to the x-axis to make a right angle. So the coordinates of that point, here's going to be x, this distance is gonna be x. the horizontal distance from the origin to the point, and the vertical distance from the origin to the point will be y. <clears throat> what we're going to do is pull this right triangle out of the unit circle. I have, here's the vertical line that I dropped down. Here is the terminal side of theta. Here is the part of the x-axis. <clears throat> now, what we have is this part of the x-axis, and here's the origin down here, 0 0.00. 0. And up here, I'm saying is cosine theta and sine theta. So what we're saying is that down here along the bottom, that x is equal to the cosine of theta. And up here on the vertical, we're saying that y is equal to sine of theta. And we want to know that this makes sense with the ratios that we drew before. Now the terminal side of theta is tracing along the unit circle. The circle is made up of all the points that are one unit away from the origin. So everything on the circle is one unit away from the origin. And so that tells us that the length of this hypotenuse is the radius of the circle 
which is one. So the hypotenuse is the radius of the circle, and that's one because it's the unit circle. The hypotenuse is the radius, and the radius is one. <clears throat> So when we write sine theta is equal to y, if we look at where we put theta, y is opposite theta and sine of theta is opposite over hypotenuse. So we're really saying that sine theta is y over one, but we never say divided by one. We just, if we don't say the denominator, it's a one. Cosine of theta. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. Adjacent is x and the hypotenuse is one. So this fits with our opposite adjacent hypotenuse definitions of the trig functions. Any questions? So looking at the unit circle, and saying that the coordinates on the unit circle are the cosine theta, x is the cosine theta, and y is sine theta, that fits with our opposite adjacent and hypotenuse. Moreover, it expands on our idea of opposite adjacent and hypotenuse. Let me grab another angle, say one in, I uh, used up a lot of space here. Hmm. Let's put another angle. Let's do one in the second quadrant. Let's put an angle in the second quadrant. See, I was th saying to myself, when I labeled y all over in here, I said, aren't I gonna use the second quadrant? And I'm like, oh, I'll label it there anyway. I was thinking I should label it over here. And then I'm like, oh, it's kind of get in the way of cosine and sine. And now I just remembered why, because I knew I wanted to do, do another angle. So <clears throat> let's make an angle that terminates in quadrant two. So here, Let's suppose that we have an angle that terminates in quadrant two. Let's call that angle P. We want to do the same thing. We know that this should be, the coordinates here are supposed to be cosine of P e sine P. E. And we want to make, th make things make sense in terms of a right triangle. In this case, we want to make a right triangle. So I'm going to drop that point cosine phi sine phi vertically down to the negative part of the x axis. So I'm going to do the same thing I did before. and pull out another right triangle. Now the acute angle between the terminal side of phi and the negative x axis is the reference angle for phi. So here is our reference angle. Phi sub r, the reference angle for phi but I still have cosine and sine have an X coordinate or are the X coordinates and the Y coordinates. So if I pull that triangle out, I have down here along the bottom, a portion of the X axis. I have the origin over here. <clears throat> The 
this point where it can, uh, the terminal side of P intersects the unit circle, it's going to be cosine P sine P. Down here along the bottom, X is going to be cosine of P and Y is going to be sine P. <clears throat> In this case, the hypotenuse is still one because we're still going around the unit circle. So the radius of the circle is one and that's the hypotenuse in this right triangle. But the angle that we have, the acute angle between the terminal side of phi and the negative x axis is the reference angle for phi in the second quadrant. So this will be the angle P sub R. The difference now is that we have signs positive or negative for cosine and sine. Cosine in the second quadrant is negative. Because if we are going to the left of the origin, cosine is negative and sine is positive. So in quadrant two, cosine is negative. Cosine is negative in quadrant two because cosine is the x coordinate and in quadrant two, the x's are negative. Sine is positive in quadrant two, because sine is y and y is positive in quadrant two. So cosine is negative in quadrant two, y is positive in quadrant two. So in this right triangle, we would mark this cosine of p as negative. This number is gonna be negative because in coordinates. But the value of cosine of phi, the absolute value of cosine of phi will be the same as the absolute value of cosine of the reference angle. So everything fits when we define trig functions, cosine and sine on this unit circle. Any questions? Here's one of the places that we want to go from here. And one of the reasons that we wanna make sure that we know all of our values. We want to look at cosine and sine, not as functions just applied to angles. So we don't wanna just apply sine and cosine to angles. We wanna apply sine and cosine to real numbers and see if those functions could prove useful in making models of things that we observe. So let's take theta, and instead of making theta go around in a circle, like we have on the unit circle, let's stretch theta out into a horizontal number line. Let's stretch theta out horizontally. So instead of theta going around in a circle, I want to take theta and I want to run theta from zero to 360 and then just keep on going. So I'm going to put a theta axis. So instead of theta going around in a circle, I'm going to stretch it out. Oops, not x, it's going to be theta. So instead of imagining a point on a wheel that just goes round and round and round, imagine a point on a wheel as the wheel rolls down the road. So instead of theta, just measuring this out here, 
imagine theta stretching out horizontally. I'm gonna place a, lot, a vertical axis. And up is gonna be positive. Let's stretch theta out horizontally and plot values of sine. Yeah, we use sine, sine's good. I just did marks at two. I don't want marks at two. I want marks at three. I'm going to need a longer axis. I used to use paper for this, but I found that with three classes, I was going through like maybe uh, a ream and a half of paper every semester. And then oh, I found this cool reusable notebook. Right, that's how, I, that's how I scan the notes. That's why we've got a code down here. It's all plastic and I can erase stuff. Hmm. So, let's start plotting values horizontally. And we're gonna plot the values of sine of theta. So theta is gonna run down here along the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis, I'm gonna put the values of sine of theta. I call it y, so y is equal to sine theta. So And I'm gonna put enough theta on the horizontal axis so that I can cover one full circle. So let's first mark off the 90, the 180, 270, and 360, or zero, 90, 180, 270, and 360. So this represents each of the quadrants. We know that sine of zero is zero. It's the y coordinate at this point on the unit circle. So sine of zero is equal to zero. So I'll plot that point first. If I go around to theta equals 90 degrees, I'll be here at the top of the circle and the y coordinate there is one. So the top of the circle is going to be at one. As theta keeps going around, the y value is decreased down to zero when we get to 180 degrees. So here we are back down at zero. Okay. Goes up, back down again. And then the y's drop negative and decrease down to negative one when we get to 270. And then the y value starts to climb again from negative one back up to zero at 360 and we've gone all the way around the circle. This is as much as we, oops, I didn't show you what I was graphing, there we go. This is as much as we need to graph because at 360, we're just gonna get a copy of what was going on at zero. So whatever I have between zero and 360, that's just gonna copy and paste from 360 to 720, and then from 720 to 1080, and then from 1080 to, I don't know how, what's after that. 
So we get this idea of a function that goes up and then down and then down and then up. And that's what's going on with the Y coordinate as we go around the circle. We start off at zero, we go up, then we go down to zero, then down to negative one, and then back up to zero. And then it just repeats that up and down cycle forever as we go around the circle forever. So this is going to be super useful in creating models of things that we observe. Anything that has some kind of periodic back and forth motion, anything that we're modeling with sound waves, anything we're modeling with light waves, any values that will go up and down in this regular pattern, we're gonna be able to model with these sine and cosine functions. Let's get more refined. So I very inconveniently put this at, let's see, one, two and a half. Good call, deep, so let's see, let's see. One, two, three, four, five. So I need one, two, uh, let's see. one, two and a half. We know that one of the values that shows up when we're going around the circle is gonna be a one half. Sine of 30 is a half. And so I wanna mark down one, two, three, four, five. So I need two and a half. Everything, with, uh, all the angles that have a reference angle of 30 are gonna have a sine of 0.5 or negative 0.5, because I know that sine of 30 is a half. So I'm gonna mark those. Sine of 30 is a half. So here at 30, There's 30 degrees in quadrant one. Thirty degrees in quadrant two will be at 150. And the sine of 150 is still a half. So here we are from 90 to 180 in quadrant two. 30 degrees in quadrant three will be 210 degrees. And the value of sine of 210 is negative one half. One half because the reference angle is 30 and sine of 30 is a half. Negative because we're now in the third quadrant and sine is negative in the third quadrant. And then finally at 330, We have a 30 degree reference angle, which gives us a value of one half and sine is negative in the fourth quadrant because Y coordinates are negative in the fourth quadrant. So there's all our one half and negative one half. Here we see sine going up and then down and then up again. Let's also get the sine of 60. We know sine of 60 is root three over two. So that's 0.877. We should know our decimals as well as our uh, exact values. And so these 0.877s will happen at the 60 degree angles. Notice that I put the 90 with three, uh, I don't know if you can see the grid that I'm using. My camera is low enough resolution that you can't really see the dots. But we have 0, 30, 60, 90, then 120 is a 60 degree reference angle in the second quadrant. 240 is a 60 degree reference angle in the third quadrant. And 300 will be my 60 degree reference angle in the fourth quadrant. So halfway up will be 0.75. So we'll wanna be a little bit closer to one when we get to 60. 
when theta gets to 60. And then the same thing down here, halfway. And we'll be kind of close to one at 240 and 300. Now we just want to connect the dots and see how this uh, the sign flows up and down. So if we connect all these dots, we can see this smooth and imagine it being smooth, this smooth flow up. And so we can see what these sine and cosine graphs are going to look like. They're going to be great for modeling quantities that are going to flow up and then down and then up and then down in a nice regular pattern. Any questions? So if we take a look at I didn't have decimals open again. Let's take a look at decimals and see what it gives us. So here, we can see the graph from zero to that's strange, it's in two pi. That's where one circle should be. That's because Desmos is gonna be graphing things with real numbers and not degrees. So two pi, uh, what the, the units that we're using here on this axis are gonna be in radians rather than in degrees. But we can see what sine is doing. Oh, we can also see that I graphed it in purple, so I should switch colors, there we go. Now it's totally gonna to make way more sense. But we can see that the graph of sine starting off at zero, going up to one at pi over two, which is 90 degrees, back down to zero at pi, which is 180 degrees, three pi over two is 270 degrees, and then two pi is 360 degrees. And we can see the value of x going up and down. And then just the pattern repeating. And it's the same waveform. Any questions? So these are going to be useful functions because we see lots of things that have these kinds of periodic motion. A pendulum swinging back and forth, but without any friction to slow things down. Or it could be like a sound wave. So this is going And then we just have to learn what will happen if we start messing with the function. What if I go to 2x? That kind of smooshed things or 4x or 8x go into higher frequencies? Or what if I want to turn up the volume and put a 2 in front of things, or a 3 in front of things, or a 4 in front of things? I didn't, I didn't mean to make the problem, that problem so loud. Let's bring it down to a lower value, a lower, make it go slower. So those of you who are out there that are building your own tube amps and stuff like that, you look at things on oscilloscope, you can hear these different examples. You can hear this one not be uh, with a low frequency and then start cranking up the frequency, the very high value. 
And then if you're like, oh, well, I have damaged hearing, so could you turn it up? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll turn it up. And so then it gets really messy. And then you're like, okay, that's enough. And then let's drop it down to a lower frequency. Now we can even hear it. Any questions? This is where we are headed. We want to take our trig value, or sorry, our trig functions and apply them to angles that go beyond 90 degrees. That's why we put this unit circle out there. Then we wanted to, we wanted to do that so we could start building trig functions, not just around a unit circle, but at where the input is something that's just going to be cyclical. That's just going to go from zero to 360, and then we're just going to copy from zero to 360. Then we just need to make adjustments so that it's not always from zero to 360 where we get one cycle, where we can fix how long we can adjust the cycle. And then we want to adjust the amplitude. So now we need to adjust the length of the cycle. Uh, let's see, it goes between one and negative one, but we're going to want to adjust the distance from the top to the bottom, adjust the amplitude. We're gonna to wanna to move the graph up and down. Maybe the middle is not at zero. Maybe the middle is somewhere and then we just go up and down from there. And then we're also gonna to wanna to move it right and left. Maybe zero, zero is not where we go through. Maybe it goes through uh, 30, zero and it starts from here. It's a little bit shifted horizontally. Maybe it's out of phase. So maybe we have a horizontal shift. So we're gonna move right and left. Before we start making these kinds of adjustments, we have to make sure that we know all of our values really well. And we start by grabbing 30, for, uh, zero, multiples of 30, multiples of 45. That kind of covers everything. Our 30, 60, 90, 120, 150, and also 45, 90, 135, 180, and so on. I didn't put those values in, mostly because it was too crowded. But in between the 30 and the 60, we'd have a 45, and that would happen at 0 0.7071. It was already getting pretty crowded up on this graph. And I know that most uh, a bunch of you who are just are writing along with me said, hey, are you gonna make anything smaller? Because already everything's all jammed up in there and you didn't draw it big enough. But then some of you I know will probably have mic that microscopic super tiny writing. And so you're like, oh, I didn't make it long wide enough for normal people writing, but I've got super tiny writing because you write in like a six point font. Any questions, comments? Snide remarks. So when you said you move it right and left, what actually are you doing? If it's not, is it still sine theta or is it sine theta plus something or sine? Well, that's what we- Something, something plus sine theta, what is it? Uh, it would be sine of theta plus or minus some angle. So uh, I don't want to give too many spoilers. Actually, this whole class is all about spoilers. But if I want to move something left and right, I want to add or subtract something from theta before we do sine. 
So if we did, um, I don't know why I'm trying to cram it down here at the bottom. But if we look at sine of theta minus 30, where everything's in degrees, this is gonna take that whole graph that we have and shift it 30 degrees to the right. Because now when theta is equal to 30, that's when sine reads sine of zero is zero. And so the starting value, it will still start and go up and then down. How much should I get? Two? Maybe two. So it'll still go up. But instead of starting off at zero, where sine of, instead of saying sine of, when theta is zero, instead of coming up with zero, sine of theta minus 30, when theta is 30, sine is zero. So here, sine of 30 minus 30 is the sine of zero, which is zero. So this, hard to say starting point, but this point will happen at 30, zero. And this whole graph will shift to the right 30 degrees. So that whole waveform shifted to the right 30 degrees. And so this is out of phase with sine of theta. The graph has been horizontally shifted. And that's going to move all the points. Instead of starting off at zero and ending at 360, we start off at 30. So this will happen at 390. Because everything is 30 degrees late. Instead of this happening at 90, this will happen at 120. Because everything has been shifted 30 degrees. That's supposed to be a comma. So everything, this minus 30 before sine happens, shifts the whole waveform 30 degrees to the right. So we've got to think about what effect on when we do adding and subtracting and multiplying and dividing with a trig function involved, what's that going to do to the graph? And that's going to give us into the larger picture of understanding the relationships between graphs and equations. So the reason that this shifted 30 degrees to the right, it was a shift because we did adding and subtracting and it uh, was horizontal because we did the subtracting of 30 before the trig function sign. Any questions? How's everybody okay? It only seems like it's a lot to remember because it's a lot to remember. And you have to remember all of it all the time in perfect detail. And this is a daunting task, but the big advantage that we have with trig is that there's lots of symmetry. There's lots of connection. There's lots of things that are just, uh, it, I mean, it's all contained in one circle. To quote Top Gear, how hard could it be? It all fits in one little circle. But then you realize that we can fit an awful lot into one little circle. Any questions? The next big topic, which is gonna to be our topic for next week, 
is knowing the other way we measure angles. We're all good with 360 degrees for one full circle. It's gonna be our favorite because 360 degrees is so divisible. You can divide it by, uh, you can divide it in quarters. You can divide it by five, you can divide it by six. Seven is weird anyway, so forget seven, but you can divide it by eight, by nine, by 10. So many factors in 360, it's such an awesome number. But the other way we measure angles is called radians. And radians are weird. First of all, we made a huge mistake way back in the day when we came up with radians. Uh, this is because we made, the, we made the number pi the ratio of the circumference of the circle to, and here's our big mistake, the diameter. So like looking back, we look back at that and we're, we, like I was there. I wasn't there. I'm not sure I would have made the other call. This is hindsight. Hindsight always 2020 and all that. So I probably would have just gone with what everybody else said. But that was a huge mistake. This should have, pi should have been the ratio of the circumference to the radius. Then it would have made more sense. Instead of 3.14, it would have been 6.28. And one full circle would have been pi. But because we decided what pi was based on the diameter, like a bunch of idiots, one full circle is two pi. Doesn't seem like a big deal to just multiply by two, but we are gonna be doing, uh, looking at multiples of pi and they're gonna be fraction multiples of pi. And we would have made our lives so much easier if we had just gone with the radius. So, People who invented pi, you messed up. Here's what we need to know initially about radians. Two pi radians, uh, the other way of measuring angles. Two pi radians is 360 degrees. Oh, someone in the chat is admitting that they were the ones that were responsible for using the diameter. That's okay. We'll, we'll forgive you. Maybe. We'll see if forgiveness happens if, when grades come out. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right, what are we talking about? Oh, yes, radians. Radians is another way we measure angles. It's just like we can measure distances in inches or distances in centimeters. It's just another way of measuring an angle. And here's how it works. Two pi radians is 360 degrees. The reason I start with two pi radians is 360 degrees is that this is one full circle. So we all knew that 360 degrees is a full circle. So 360 degrees is two pi radians. Everything else is gonna be fraction multiples of pi. So over here, we're gonna have zero or 360 degrees. And in radians, this will be zero or two pi. Up at the top. This is gonna be 90 degrees, but that's a full circle divided by four. Two pi over four is pi over two. So this is two pi, a full circle divided by four, but we're not gonna write two pi over four, we're gonna write this as pi over two.
We can't be too hard on the people that came up with this number pi. They didn't even know that numbers could be irrational. So, I mean, they were so limited. They knew so little. They did a lot with it, but I mean, they just, they just didn't know so much. Over here, we know we're at a half a circle is 180 degrees. And that's a half a circle. So I'm gonna take my two pi and divide it by two. But we're not gonna write two pi divided by two all the time. We were gonna simp simplify the two over two and call that just pi, one pi. Down here at the bottom, that's 270 degrees. That's three quarters of a circle. That'll be three quarters of two pi. That'll be three fourths of two pi. But we'll simplify that. Three fourths of two is three halves. So we'll call that three pi over two. These are just more associations that we have to make. You don't gotta memorize these values, but you gotta be exposed to them so much that you can't forget them, that they're just part of you. Like the lyrics to your favorite song or the lyrics to your least favorite song that you just can't get out of your head. Maybe used in a commercial where they misspelled a short word for automobile. Because now you're all singing that song in your head now. What we wanna get used to, the reason I write these, uh, uh, I like writing these fractions is that we, we gotta learn how to count in fractions and going around 90 degrees, we start off at zero, then we got one pi over two, two pi over two, three pi over two, two pi would be like four pi over two. So we're just gonna to learn to count in fractions. So you should learn the radian measures of all your common reference angles. So you're also gonna to wanna to know your radian measures of your quadrant angles, zero degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees, 360 degrees. You're gonna to wanna to cut these all in half and know your radian measures of uh, your 45 degree angles. Zero degrees, 45 degrees, 135 degrees, 225, 315. You're gonna to wanna to know all your 30s. Zero degrees, 30 degrees, 150 degrees, uh, 210 degrees, 330 degrees. And you're gonna to wanna to know all of your 60s, zero degrees, 60 degrees, uh, 120 degrees, 240 degrees, and 300 degrees. You're gonna to wanna to recognize all these degree measures in radians as a fraction multiples of pi. and then know them so well that they just become interchangeable. Any questions? Then you're gonna to have to find some way to make it all make sense in your mind, some way that will help you remember all these. I personally do, I count around the circle in fractions of pi over four, and pi over six. Pi over four for my 45 degrees and pi over six for my 30s because knowing the 30s will get me the 60s as well. And also get me, and both of them will meet up with the 90s. Any questions? Comments? Snide remarks? All right, I can do a quick recap after we uh, stop the video. So 
for now. That's going to do it for today. That's going to do it for this week. I'll see y'all on Tuesday. Everybody have a good day, a good weekend, and thanks for playing. Stick around if you want a recap of the first page.